Well, thank you for that nice introduction, and thank all of you for coming. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. So this paper is, um, I suppose, like many others, uh, in some sense, inspired by events of the last you know, four or five years. So it, this paper is not going to deal with the, you know, the sources of the financial crisis, but what it does deal with is perhaps a story about the, the very slow recovery. Let's see if I can. Oops. Yeah. This is. This is just a pointer. Or this is. I can just use the page up. Okay, so this is this is a story about the about the the, the slow recovery. So I'm going to uh, take you through just my intellectual history as to how I got onto this question, and it was really just by looking at some very broad facts about the about the U.S. economy. I don't know what's true in Britain. I mean, maybe something is is similar similar is going on here. So one, one fact is that after falling rather dramatically in you know, the end of 2008 and 2009, uh, investment spending in the US has been very low, uh, prolonging the, the downturn. And I'll just show you, uh, this is a, a picture uh, from uh, uh, Tom Cooley and Peter Rupert have some figures on just comparing different downturns. So this, the, the big dark line at the bottom is, uh, you know, the, the, the current uh, episode, and the others are previous recessions. So 1973, 81, and so on. And you see that investment, it, it, it fell farther, and it's also been very, very slow to recover. A second fact is, in the US is that lots of large firms hold substantial reserves of uh, liquid assets. So if you ask, is investment spending depressed because banks aren't willing to lend, certainly for a lot of the very large firms, that's not the reason. They're sitting on big piles of cash, and if they wanted to invest, they could do it without borrowing. And that's not true of all firms, but it's true of, of uh, you know, a substantial number of large firms. A third fact is that the U.S. Uh, in the last few years has started piling up uh, public debt in a way that we haven't seen since, you know, the end, really the end of World War II. So after being pretty stable at about, you know, 35, 36, 37 percent of GDP in the early in the middle aughts, it's grown to 40, 50, 60, and uh, by some counts now 100 percent of, of GDP. And there's no, this, this is by itself worrisome, but you know, there, there's, there's kind of no end in sight. So the, the, the things, some of the things that are driving you know, the, the big deficits, so social security spending, Medicare spending, are only gonna get worse in the, in the, in the coming years as the baby boomers retire and there are you know, fewer uh, working people you know, uh, you know, compared with the whole population. So the U.S. is on an unsustainable fiscal course, and um, it, it seems clear major reforms are going to have to happen. We're, we're, kind of, we're, we're driving off a cliff, and, and something will have to be done. Another fact is there's no consensus on what the something should be. Some, some groups advocate big spending cuts, um, especially to entitlements, other groups well, they don't really advocate big tax increases, but they're, they're definitely against the spending cuts. So, you know, implicitly, I guess they have to be in favor of tax increases. 
And, 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 the, and the last fact is that some of the tax changes being talked about, and, and I think, you know, in the end, my view is it's probably going to have to come, the, the reforms are going to have to come both from the, the spending and the tax side. They're likely to have a major effect on the profitability of investment. Or another aspect of policy that, that brings in a lot of uncertainty is the recent health care legislation in the U.S. I don't think anyone has a very clear notion yet how that's going to, you know, impact firms, their, their, their labor costs, and, and so there's a, a fair amount of uncertainty. Will it be reversed by the courts? Will it go forward? And how much is it going to cost if it does go forward? So the, the hypothesis of this paper is that, that fiscal uncertainty is contributing to the depressed investment in the U.S., uh, that the, the high degree of uncertainty raises the option value of just waiting wait and see what tax legislation is going to look like and, um, it's, you know, and, and for at least for decisions that are difficult or expensive to reverse after they're made. So this is, this is all right, so that's the end of the empirical work. Um, the, this paper is it's a, it's a theoretical paper. So what it does is develop a simple model where uncertainty about tax policy leads to a temporary decline in investment. Um, and it's, it, this temporary decline is going to, I call it delay, but what it means is that firms are just going to, you know, they're just going to wait. They're going to take a wait and see attitude. So they're just going to, you know, uh, just, you know, sit and do nothing and wait for the uncertainty be, to be resolved. So then when the uncertainty is resolved, there's going to be a temporary investment boom. Um, just you know, exploiting these projects that have been on the back burner, uh, you know, while they're waiting. So the size of the boom is going to depend on the realized tax rate. So is, is, do, do taxes turn out to be you know very high or only moderately high? Um, and uh, so if if they're you know the, the lower they are, the bigger the boom that's going to be generated. And let me say that while the while the um, the, the model I'm going I'm to talk. I'm going to you know use the the, the, the template of a, a tax reform, tax uncertainty about taxes and investment spending. But exactly the same idea could be applied to hiring decisions, to household decisions about you know purchasing houses or other durables, and to uncertainty about all kinds of things: financial regulation, trade policy, energy policy. You know, fill in the blank. So the, the goal, in a sense, is to build a model where, in the short run, uh, uh, markets or firms, they, they dislike uncertainty. Maybe that's not a very good phrase, but they, in the face of uncertainty, they, just, they choose to, to just wait and see. OK, so, so what's delay? So in the model here, investment is going to have two inputs, uh, projects and goods, and both of these are going to be storable. So that's going to you know, create the possibility for delay. And, and delay is going to be, de I'm going to define delay as a situation where both of these inputs are just are stored. So in a literal sense, firms are just sitting on the inputs and, and waiting for the uncertainty to, to be resolved. Um, so when in this theoretical model, when is this uh, strategy of delay used? Agents are going to accumulate stocks of both inputs if and only if there's uncertainty about the, the coming policy reform. So if, the, if the ref a reform is announced for the future, firms might uh, choose to accumulate one stock or the other but they wouldn't. They would not. Uh, they would not accumulate both. Um, on the other hand, if if there is uncertainty, there will always be some period of delay. So, you know, if a, if a tax change is expected in the in the in the in the near term and its form is uncertain, there'll be delay. Firms are going to take this wait and see attitude. You know, right from the get go, until the uncertainty is resolved. If the, if the date of the uncertainty is very far in the future, they might be investing up until some window before the date of the reform, and then and that's when the investment will stop. But um, so the size 
the, the, the length of period when firms are going to be stalling is, is obviously going to be related to the magnitude of the, the uh, uncertainty. Okay, so there's, there's a little bit of related literature. There's a lot of work on uncertainty and in investment. Um, not much of it has to do with this particular type of uncertainty. So, uh, you know, uh, so there's a whole literature on investment and uncertainty, but most of it is not this kind of uncertainty. So the key thing here is that it's an aggregate shock that uh, is expected to come. And, uh, and, and it affects everyone. And so that gives the possibility for it to, to generate you know, a, a, you know, a, a decline in aggregate investment. Um, so uh, Villa Verde and some co-authors have a, an empirical paper that is uh, very related to this. And then uh, Baker, Bloom, and Davis also have a, a very empirical paper, which is also quite related. And I'm going to, in fact, show you uh, one of their graphs. So what, the, what, what Baker, Bloom, and Davis do is construct an index of, uh, uh, an un of uncertainty that, and they use, you know, they're just, they're, they're combining three different things. So one is uh, the frequency of uh, media references to economic policy uncertainty. So they just, you know, they, they, they just look in the, you know, the Google archives and, and, you know, count these references. Another one is the number of federal tax code provisions set to expire. So in the U.S. often Congress passes a, a, a tax provision with a, with a sunset on it, and then you know, with, you know when the sunset comes, something will have to be done. And the other is the extent of forecaster disagreement about inflation and, and government purchases. That one gets a, a, a rather modest weight. So, um, so let me just show you their, their index. So you see, this, is, this I've just lifted from their paper, and you can see these spikes, you know, many of them at, at around dates, you know, that, that you recognize. So the, the uh, the, the, the crisis at long-term capital gives a, a moderate spike. Uh, the 9-11 attacks gives a big one. Uh, the Gulf War, a big one. Uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, even bigger. And then the, the Euro crisis has you know, uh, achieved new heights in, in this spike of uncertainty. So, uh, so I take this as empirical confirmation that, that uh, uh, in, there does seem to be a lot of uncertainty. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is, is uh, just describe the model, give you an overview of the model. Um, then, just as, as uh, a warm-up, review the effects of tax changes in a setup where storing these inputs is not possible. So, and this is going to be, so this is a very old-fashioned kind of model. You're going to probably recognize it, many of you. You've probably taught it, many of you. Then we'll look at the economy with these storage possibilities. Um, I'm going to state the, the two main results, which I've already told you, and then, and then look at a numerical example. OK, so just uh, as an overview of the model, um, there are going to be two commodities. So they're, they're homogeneous goods, which are used for consumption and investment. And then the novel feature here, there's going to be something I call projects, which they're just going to arrive exogenously at a constant rate. And uh, the key thing is that investment is going to require a project. You can't just have goods. You have to have a project to invest those goods in. So um, OK, so that's, that's kind of the, the key theoretical novelty. Now, what are these projects? I want to think of them as just opportunities that are open to a specific investor. So uh, for a chain store, it would be the location of a new retail outlet. Uh, for a manufacturing firm, maybe the opportunity to build a new plant. Uh, for a real estate develop developer, it's a parcel of land that's available for development. Now, the important thing about these projects is they're exclusive to one investor. And something like that is key. You could relax this assumption to some extent, but something like that is key. 
otherwise, um, if, a pro if, if projects were available, if any particular project was available to everybody, you'd have this kind of Bertrand-like competition to be in there investing. And, you know, a, a, an investor couldn't, like, sit on his projects because somebody else would exploit them while he's waiting. So you, you, you could relax this a little bit and have, you know, maybe some probability that projects become publicly available. But just for, for, for you know, theoretical simplicity, I'm going to say that they're just exclusive to the particular investor, and he can just hold on to it as, as long as he likes. Um, Okay, so projects require, or investment requires a project and an input of goods. So I call the, the, I call the, the second one an intensity decision, how many goods to put into this project. And the second key assumption is that that intensity decision is irreversible. Um, so again, this could be relaxed to some extent, but the, the thing that's going to create the option value is the fact that uh, uh, investors want to target their intensity uh, decision to the tax, the tax rate that's in effect. So higher taxes are going to lead to a lower intensity of investment. Um, and uh, so that's why investors are going to have an, an incentive to, if there's substantial uncertainty about the tax rate, to wait and see what, what that's going to be. And then, as I said, both, both are storable. And here I'm going to say they, that stored goods or no return, uh, neither do they depreciate. You could put in, you know, probably some depreciation uh, and qualitatively get similar results. It's, it's, it makes, you know, it's very clean just to make a storage technology. So let me say, like, th this model's set up as a very, you know, it's a, a, an extremely simple general equilibrium model, but I really think of this as more of a partial equilibrium story about firms, you know, deciding to postpone, not just postpone investment until, uh, until uncertainty is resolved. Okay, so times are going to be continuous. Uh, total investment, a flow is the product of uh, N, the number of projects that an investor is implementing, and I, the intensity of investment per project, so I, capital I, is that uh, investment flow. Um, and the cost of investment is uh, strictly convex, so to invest at the, at the to produce the, the investment flow I, uh, you have to pay, you know, this, this goods cost, and the, the cost depends on the number of projects available. So this is what gives projects their, their value. If you want to achieve a total, you know, a certain target aggregate investment flow, you can do it more cheaply if it's spread across more projects. So this function, the important thing about this function G is that it's strictly convex, and that's, uh, okay, so, and that, that's, that's a, a, a key fact. Okay. Uh, at the moment when the uncertainty is resolved, there's also going to be a massive investment, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay, the rest of the model is just, it's, you know, extremely simple. Um, <clears throat> installed capital produces uh, output linearly and depreciates at a constant rate. There's a representative agent, which is, you know, an amalgam of a, a household and a firm. Uh, so they've got this utility function U, standard utility function, and uh, a constant discount rate. And they are making these investment decisions as well. Now, the model could be extended to allow endogenously supplied labor and use, put that as an input into production. And I think that actually, you know, I'm, I'm I, I haven't, you know, I haven't worked on that yet, but I'm, I'm kind of curious to do that because I think in terms of thinking about the welfare implications of this delay, that, that's, that would be uh, a much more interesting setup. Okay, and then the, the policy is just going to be a flat rate tax on output with the proceeds rebated lump sum to all the households.
Okay, so as I said, first we're gonna look at a benchmark model with no storage. So this is just, you know, it's like a really simplified version of the neoclassical growth model. And, you know, the, 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 the mathematics here, this is, this is very retro. So this is 1960s, you know, technology. So the, uh, okay, so we're gonna think of first about a, a household, um, an economy that at date zero has this fixed tax rate in place. Um, and the representative agent's problem is gonna be to choose consumption and investment over the infinite future, given his initial capital stock, and uh, he's choosing it to maximize you know, discounted uh, lifetime utility. The law of motion for capital is pretty standard. Mu is the exogenous supply of projects that arrive. So projects are just used as they arrive. I is the intensity decision. So the law of motion for capital is very standard. And consumption then is, you know, whatever is not invested. So the first, uh, the first term there is uh, output net of taxes. The second is the lump sum rebate. And the third is the cost of the investment. Okay. And then in equilibrium, the, the lump sum rebate has to be the, uh, the, the, the tax revenue. Okay, so uh, if, as long as ta is, the tax rate's not too large, there's a unique competitive equilibrium and it converges to a steady state. And I guess the, the key thing is that the steady state intensity is decreasing in the tax rate. High taxes make you invest less. Okay, and just, uh, so here's, here's the stable manifold from the neoclassical growth model, and in this setup, it just, it looks exactly the same. So given a capital stock on the horizontal axis, you just pick the point on, the, on that, that stable manifold, the green line, and the, on the vertical axis is the co-state variable, and you just glide along that saddle path to the steady state. So convergence is smooth and, and monotonic. Okay, so, so as a warm up, I wanna think about three tax experiments in this model, just so you get an idea about what's new in the model with delay. So these three tax experiments, um, they're gonna start I I at the same, from the same point. So at date zero, there's a tax rate to zero, and in the, in the figures, I'm gonna think of that as a low tax rate and the capital stock is at the steady state that's appropriate given that tax rate. So the first experiment is gonna be an immediate and permanent change in the tax rate to, and, and the figure's gonna illustrate what happens for two different possibilities. So either the tax rate, either the new tax rate's low or high, but it, it comes in, whatever it is, it comes in at date zero, everybody knows, and then uh, there's no further tax changes after that. Okay, the second one is like the first, except that the tax is announced at date zero and it takes effect only at, at date one. So you have a one year interval where it's known that the tax rate is going to change and it's known what it's going to change to. And then the third possibility is again, the tax change, it's announced at date zero that there will be a reform it will occur, occur at date one. The rate will either be the medium rate or the high rate, and, but the uh, and only probabilities are known. That, so, so, here, so there is uncertainty. Okay, so if the, if the tax rate is announced at, 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 if the tax rate takes effect at date zero, the, the economy just jumps from the old steady state to the appropriate point on the new stable manifold and then converges smoothly to the new steady state. So the higher tax rates produce lower steady states and notice that during the transition path, the capital stock is always falling. So it falls continuously. So I'll just show you uh, 
time pass. So the upper left-hand corner shows the, the evolution of the capital stock over the first you know, century. The dotted lines are the steady state levels, and you see that for the moderate uh, tax, to the, the tax increase to the moderate rate, you get a moderate decline in steady state capital. For the higher tax rate, you get a more, more severe decline, and, and you just converge smoothly. Notice that the invest, investment, the, the dotted lines are always the, the steady state levels. The, the investment intensity jumps uh, from its previous steady state level of two. It takes a downward jump because the tax change is always an increase, and it takes a more severe downward jump if it's the larger increase, and then declines further towards its new steady state. Consumption, notice that consumption jumps up when the tax rate, the tax increase occurs, um, the only way to you know work off the capital stock is to you just raise current consumption. That's the flip side of cutting investment. So consumption jumps up initially and jumps up more in the face of a, a big tax increase, and then declines towards its new steady state level. Okay, if, if the tax rate takes place not at date zero, but at date cap T, but it's announced at date zero and it's known what the change will be, you don't jump immediately to the new stable manifold. You take a little jump and then say, if it's the moderate tax rate, you take that small jump and then the tax rate declines, the co-state also declines, and then at date T, when the tax rate actually takes effect, you do that, uh, there's a corner, and now you, and then you glide up the stable manifold. And the, the size of the initial jump has to be chosen so that after capital T units of time, the economy's on that stable manifold. So that dictates the size of the jump. And, uh, as you see, the, 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 if you look at the, 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 the time plots, they're, uh, they're rather similar. I think the differences, you know, if you look at the investment ten intensity, it, uh, it, it doesn't jump down quite as much at date zero, then it declines rather sharply between date zero and, and date capital T, and then continues more, more smoothly. Consumption, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, it, it, it takes the same kind of jump, um, but uh, doesn't, if, over the first, between zero and date capital T, it doesn't uh, decline so rapidly. Okay, finally, if you have a tax change with uncertainty, uh, there's, there, now there are gonna be uh, two jumps, so the, 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 uh, the economy jumps from the steady state down to uh, that, that black dot at, where it says T equals zero. And then between date zero and capital T, cap, the capital stock declines. And then at date T, after the uncertainty is resolved, well, there, there are two possibilities. You, you're still, this, in, in here, the, the capital stock's still gonna keep declining, but, but the, how it's gonna happen depends on whether it's the high or the low tax rate in effect. So if we look at these, now when we look at these time plots, you see that the capital stocks for these two, you know, they're, they're two experiments. Well, they're two continuations of the same experiment. So initially the capital stock is the same. You know, no one knows whether the, the, the new tax rate's gonna be medium or very high. And the investment intensity, you see that at date capital T, you know, it's it, over the period from zero to T, it's kind of a moderate level. And then it either jumps up or jumps down after the uncertainty is resolved. And consumption takes a jump in the opposite direction. Okay, so. Okay, so the higher, higher tax rates, you know, they depress investment. Um, and they do it immediately, uh, you know, even if the tax change is not coming until the future. So, so the, the investment is depressed in, a, you know, in anticipation of the new and higher tax rate. Okay, so, so that's 
that's kind of by way of background. Um, and now we want to think about an economy where agents also have the, the possibility to just store inputs into investment. So again, we're going to think about a tax change at date capital T, drawn from a known distribution F, and then no subsequent changes after that. So uh, the agent's problem between zero and T is to maximize utility over zero T. And then there's a continuation value. And so as, as economists, our first order of business is to figure out what this, this function little v looks like, which is the continuation value. And what does the continuation value depend on? Well, it's the stocks of capital. M is the stock of stored projects. And H is the stock of stored goods. So the, at, at date T, after the uncertainty is resolved, the value from that point on depends on those three stocks and, and the realized tax rate. Now, what is that? So I'm not, I'm not going to go into details of what that function looks like. Um, so how do you characterize it? Well, there's a control problem that looks a lot like the first one, but with one uh, additional twist, which is right at date T, the agent has this stock of projects and a stock of goods and has at least the option to do a mass of investment. So just take a bunch of projects and a bunch of goods and do a lump of investment. Um, so take a mass of ideas. You choose an intensity for, for the ideas and produce a discrete mass of new capital, delta K. And the goods required are just the mass of goods times you know, G of I, where I is the intensity for all of these projects. And then the, the, the post after this discrete, uh, discrete adjustment, the, st the stock of capital increases by you know, delta K. The stock of ideas decreases by N hat. And the stock of goods uh, also decreases. So what's important, uh, you know, points one and two, I would say the important one is really point three here, which is it's, it's, a, it's a fact about this economy that this discrete adjustment always exhausts one of the input stocks. So after, after the uncertainty is resolved, there's no point in keeping too many stocks around. And in particular, you wouldn't keep stocks of both, uh, both inputs. So which one's exhausted? It depends on the, the, you know, how the uncertainty is resolved. So a high tax rate makes projects relatively less valuable, because you're not interested in doing that much investment anyway, and makes goods relatively more valuable. So since the agent's not interested in doing so much investment, the investments have a lower intensity. So they use up all the projects, but there's some goods left over. And then those goods can be used you know, subsequently for either consumption or, or further investment. And for low tax rates, uh, it's the reverse. So these uh, stock of projects, it could all be used up or, or, or only partly used up by this discrete adjustment. OK, so this model is extremely simple. And the simplicity lets you um, prove a couple of propositions. So there, there are two main results. So the first, as I, I, I told you before, a stochastic change in the tax rate at a date capital T in the future, announced at t equals 0, always leads to a period of delay, accumulation of both inputs. And uh, the, the proof has to do with some conditions involving the co-state variables. Um, so the only way you can get those conditions to hold is if there's a discrete adjustment. And the only way you can have a discrete adjustment is if there are stocks of inputs. And if inputs are being accumulated, then investment go, it goes to 0 for some, some period of time. OK, and the second result is that a deterministic change in the tax rate 
never leads to accumulation of both inputs. It might lead to accumulation of one or the other, but not both. And again, the proof has to do with some uh, conditions on the co-states. Okay, so now, now I'm just I'm going to talk about some an example, um, and just uh, just show you some some plots so to give you a sense of like what what difference uh, this uh, possibility of delay makes. So the example is going to use uh, constant relative risk aversion utility, uh, a quadratic cost function um, with a quadratic cost function, there's no harm in just setting the inflow rate of projects equal to unity, so set mu equal to one. Um, and then the rest of the parameters, uh, you know, I would say this is, it's not really a representation of the U.S. economy, but I tried to pick parameters which are not totally wacky. So the depreciation rate is 6%, A is 0.5, this gives a capital output ratio of two, Discount rate's 4% and, and utility is log. Uh, and the date uh, when the tax reform is going to occur is, is date one. So there's a, there's a, you know, and why did I choose date one? Well, if you, make, if you make that date too long, it's not optimal for the delay to begin immediately. So I wanted to make this short enough so the, the delay starts immediately at date zero. Okay, and this reform, the, t the tax rate in the initial economy is 20%, uh, and then it's going to arise to either 30% or 40%, and uh, the, the odds are 50-50. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you some, some pictures. So this is the, this is the, uh, the, the key. The, the blue curves are from the moderate tax rate, the red ones for the high tax rate, and green for the initial uh, tax rate. Um, and then I'm going to show you the economies with and without storage. So the solid is with storage, and the, it's actually the broken lines without storage, and the dotted lines when they appear are steady state levels. Okay, so first let's look at the capital stock. And I'm going to give you the long view first, just so you have an idea. So in the long view, you know, in either case, the economy is headed towards the steady state for the relevant tax rate. And so, you know, this is 60 years. Um, you know, you, is, all the action is up there, you know, near date zero. Uh, now with the 20-year horizon, you start to see a little bit of a difference between the economies with and without storage. And let's focus a little bit more on the, on, the, on the very early period. So what happens is over the period from zero, from date zero to date one, the capital stock just declines. You know, it's, it's almost linear. Um, and then this is in the economy with storage. In the economy without storage, notice it just, it declines slightly and then it, it, it forks out. At date one, depending on the resolution of the uncertainty, it declines very rapidly for the high tax rate, less rapidly for the lower tax rate. For the economy with storage, there's this big decline over the period from zero to one, because investment has just stopped altogether. At date one, there's this massive investment that brings, you know, the econ that brings the capital spot back to something close to where it would have been, uh, you know, if, if storage weren't available. And then the two branches again diverge. Um, now notice here, the, the massive investment at date one actually brings the, the capital stock up a little higher for the, uh, the, the economy with the high tax rate. Now the reason for that is the, if, 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 the, if, the, if the moderate tax rate is the one that occurs, uh, there's people, the agents want to do relatively more investment. They have a limited stock of goods on hand, so they use all of those goods, they invest in some of the projects, and they hold some of the projects back to, uh, to invest in over the next, you know, couple of years. So 
and why do they do that? Well, they want to invest at this higher intensity, and they don't have enough goods to do it you know, all, all, all at once. Now, let me say that you know, if it, I didn't put, you know, there was, I had some figures with a third set of lines, and it just, they were getting too, uh, too unwieldy. So what happens in the economy with, with, the, with the storage is you get, you get back actually closer to what these trajectories look like in the economy where the tax rate is just announced at date zero. So the uncertainty is resolved at date zero. Um, if you look at the intensity of investment, um, that always jumps at date one in either regime. Uh, notice, in, 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 for this particular example, the economies with and without delay are very similar. If the high tax rates realized, um, the, the, a little bit more different if the lower tax rates realized the intensity uh, adjusts differently because the, the, this, the economy is very goods constrained during this period when the excess projects are, are being invested in. So um, the intensity recovers more slowly. You know, there's, uh, this, there you can see it better. So, um, so instead of jumping up immediately to where that dash dot line is, it, it glides up slowly because some of the investment there is really, it's coming out of foregone consumption. So it's, uh, if we look at the total flow of investment, so this is, like, this is the investment boom I was talking about. So this depressed investment is then offset to a large extent by this mass of investment at date one. You know, it's a mass because it's, I've used continuous time. And then, so those are the, 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 the big red dot and the big blue dot are the, let's, let's get the close up here, are the masses of investment at date one. And then notice that if the, if the moderate tax rate is realized, there's also this period for about the next two years where there's a big investment boom, um, just the stored projects are, are taken advantage of. So the, the dots are you know, part of the boom and then if the low tax rate is realized, the, this, this other you know, bit at the top is the, the, another part of the boom. Okay, this, let's look at consumption. You know, and then consumption is it's just, it's, it's like a mirror image of investment. So uh, it's um, that uh, over the period from zero to one, uh, consumption is uh, falling in the economy with delay. So it's, uh, uh, and that's just driven by the interest rate. And then when the delay is realized, consumption jumps up if the high tax rate's realized, because you're gonna wanna decumulate and jumps down and, and rather severely to, in, to finance this, the rest of the investment boom in case the, the low tax rates realized. Okay, so, so the, the positive predictions of this little model are very stark. Um, policy uncertainty leads to a, a sharp decline in investment and larger swings in consumption than if in a setup where delays are not possible. I would say the welfare implications are, are, uh, are, are less clear. I mean, to my mind, this, this model is not very well set up to think about welfare conclusions. There, there's no purpose for the tax rate here. You know, it's just the, the, the funds are just rebated. So it's like anything which drives the economy closer to the no tax solution is more efficient. But that doesn't really seem like a very interesting welfare conclusion. Um, here, the decline, what is true is that the decline in investment over this period before the uncertainty resolved is much of it uh, uh, made up for by the boom that occurs afterwards. So it's, uh, my, the analogy I like, it's like you know, grocery store sales during a blizzard. So during the day of the blizzard, nobody can get out, nobody buys any groceries. But then a lot of those sales are made up for the next day when people uh, restock their, their fridge. 
now, you know, would, would the, so what would the welfare consequences look like in, a, in a, a, per, a less stark and more realistic version of this model? Well, if you think about this notion that investment is just, uh, you know, booms at one time or, you know, a, a dep low investment at one time is offset by a boom sometime, some other time, you know, that's also what occurs over business cycles. So I would think, you know, this, this model might deliver, you know, welfare uh, consequences that are on the same order of magnitude as those that come out of business cycle models. And I think a model that put in labor input might deliver actually, you know, more, more, it would be more interesting in terms of thinking about welfare because if, uh, if the, uh, if the lack of investment means some uh, workers in particular industries are laid off and unemployed, there, you know, that labor is not storable. So um, I think you might get a, a, a more interesting, it would be a more interesting welfare, uh, the welfare questions would be more interesting in a, in a model with, um, perhaps with labor. But, uh, but I would say just, it does illustrate, you do, you do get this very stark result that, you know, just as you think the uncertainty creates this real option value and investors respond. Okay. I'm happy to take questions. That was perfect timing. Uh, we have uh, some time for, uh, for a few questions. So if you have a question down here, maybe while the microphone uh, travels down the stairs, I'll, I'll start with one question. I, I uh, sort of have, uh, after listening to the talk, uh, bringing you a little bit back to your initial motivation, which is the current uh, slump uh, in investment in the US. I think one thing that was striking about the paper, I thought, was that it reminded us that there are many different ways of getting an investment slump when there are future changes in fiscal policy uh, in prospect. And in particular, uh, you, know, you reminded us that another way is just to uh, make people realize that or, or, or believe that there will be future tax increases. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a story which is just based on the fact that there will be the tax increases, it doesn't rely so much on the uncertainty uh, component. So the question I have is, is uh, does, does the model help us trying to look for symptoms that is one story rather than the other? Is, is, the, is the uncertainty story versus the uh, knowledge that tax increases in the future are coming? Yeah, that is, that's a good question. So I would say the thing that's unique about this, this setup is that it, it, it's not only that the prospect of a tax increase de decreases investment, but it also leads to a boom after the uncertainty is resolved. And it leads to a boom, some, a boom of some size, regardless of how the uncertainty is resolved. So in terms of looking for evidence, I would look for, I would look for the boom, because that's, that is the thing that's distinctive about this, this model. Okay, um, I was wondering what would happen in this model if there was not uncertainty in the tax rate, but uncertainty in the timing of the tax change. Right. So I think one of the things in America is they're not sure when they're actually gonna start raising tax rates in response to the fiscal crisis. I wondered what would happen um, with uncertainty in timing. You know, I haven't, I haven't worked out that model. I've thought about a, a, a related model, which is sort of this story, but with uncertainty about capital T. And I think the one that would be tractable would just be, you know, a, 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 you know, a constant hazard rate for the arrival of the tax change. Now, if the, if the, if the size of the tax change is known, I'm not sure you would get this kind of delay I think you might just get kind of more, a more gradual. See, the, the, the thing, what the delay, what storing both these inputs does, I mean, the reason you do that is because there's a, here there's an option, there's a, 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 an option value to waiting to make the intensity decision. Now, if the tax rate that's, going, that's coming is known, I would think at least th that, uh, you, you have a, the investor has a clear idea of what kind of intensity he wants for his investments. 
So I'm not sure you would get it with uncertainty about T by itself, but I think it would be interesting to like add uncertainty about the date to this setup. Um, and I think I think then you would you would still get delay. In your model, consumption and investment are negatively correlated, but isn't the stylized fact of the current recession that consumption and investment simultaneously dropped down? And how can you reconcile that? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a problem. There, there's, a, there's a lot that's left out of this model. I, I, I agree. Um, as I, you know, I'll, I'll retreat to my earlier statement that in some sense this is more of a partial equilibrium story. So, um, yeah, I might do better to just uh, package it that way and avoid that awkward question <laughs> altogether. <laughs> but then the next question is there is, for example, a study by Bachmann and Bayer who show that the partial equilibrium results of, for example, the Bloom study go away if you implement it in general equilibrium. So that might probably not be the way to go. Well, it'll keep, it'll keep me employed for a while, working at this. At, at the beginning, you, you mentioned very clearly that uh, some competition over the projects uh, relaxing this monopoly uh, power of a firm and a project uh, would uh, change the, the, the timing. Is there any other mechanism that could actually feed this uncertainty, some kind of uh, anything that would create some kind of strategic complementarity across investment or so that, because you know, the competition is, is a good observation but also a strong constraint on the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, thing. here, you know, I don't think that by itself, I don't think it would create strategic complementarity, but it would just create, it would, it would uh, create an incentive, an extra incentive to use the projects before, you know, they leak out and become available to other investors. Um, yeah, I'm not, you know, I think, well, the strategic complementarity would require, uh, you know, then you would, you would, you would have, you would, then you would really, you would need a general equilibrium set up and, and something more than there is here. So I guess, you know, maybe many, uh, you could have, you know, here there's just one good, there's one, you know, all the projects are the same. So if you had some heterogeneity in the projects, you know, here it's, I mean, the notion that investment goes to zero, I mean, that, that's kind of crazy too, but you could, you could, you know, put in some heterogeneity in the projects, so some of them are always getting funded, you know, maybe give them different hazard rates of go leaking out, so the ones with very high ra hazard rates, they get funded all the time. The one with low hazard rates get, uh, you know, they get stored. Um. There's time for one last question. Let me ask one last question. Uh, it, it may be a, a bit of too Keynesian a question for your taste, but let me ask you anyway. Uh, so in your story, the, the firm really worries about the tax rate uh, because that's going to hit profits, and that's the only way in which uncertainty in fiscal policy hits profits. But in the current U.S. situations, as you reminded us, there is also uh, another way in which uh, the fiscal problems could be resolved, which is large cuts in government spending. And a firm with a Keynesian view of the world would also worry about that because it would have consequences for, for demand and then consequences also for profit. So you think that that kind of uncertainty also could be worked into this, uh, this framework and, and have similar effects? Yeah. Um, and that's a harder one because if you, I guess, you know, I, I have a less clear idea about how, uh, you know, either consumers or investors would respond to changes in uh, government spending. I suppose you could think about entitlements and consumers, households would have, you know, some incentive to offset if they thought there could be large substantial changes in entitlements, you know, that would be um, something they would, they would, you know, 
if they anticipate that, they're going to start taking action immediately. You know, I mean, a change in entitlements is, uh, that would, you know, it's like, it's like a, a, I suppose, a, if, if you were expecting uh, Social Security to remain untaxed, and now they say it's going to be taxed, you know, it's, it's the, the line between spending changes and tax changes, is, it gets, starts to get very muddy. So. Okay, thank you again for Nancy for that great lecture. Thank you.